Good morning, I'm Morgan of Morgan Donner Showing Party, and this video is part one of a new dress diary series covering how I make a 16th century Italian gown. In part one, we're going to cover how I go about taking an old pattern for a different gown, altering it to fit my new specs, and turning it into a new pattern, including a mock-up to test that my changes still work and that I've got the fit and look that I want. Whenever I start a new project, I try to start with a pattern that I already have, rather than draft up an entirely new one each and every time. The dress that I want to make is going to be very similar to this one, which is a late 16th century Venetian gown. I'm trying the dress on to make sure there aren't any fitting issues that I'm going to want to address before making a new outfit. It has been a while since I've tried this dress on, so I want to check that I haven't got any bigger or smaller, or that there aren't any spots that pinch or rub uncomfortably. Fortunately, this pattern isn't really going to need much adjustment. It's already pretty good. I will make a few minor changes to the neckline and how the strap meets the body of the gown, but very minor, really. Here's the pattern for the red dress that I just tried on. I have notes on each pattern labeling which outfit I used for whether or not I included seam allowance and a date. I always recommend labeling your patterns. It's really easy to end up with a pile of bodice patterns and no idea which dresses they ended up becoming. Don't cut up or alter your existing patterns, since you might want them later. Trace the old pattern exactly as it is on the patterning paper, and then start making adjustments on the new pattern. I have a note on the old pattern that suggests adding some width to the back right here, so I'm adding that now. The 16th century Taylor Pattern Book by Juan de Alcega has an interesting backward shoulder strap that I'd like to try. I'm altering the front piece here to include that backward strap. In theory, this angle will provide a wider neckline, which is really great for Italian styles, while still hugging the shoulder so that the strap doesn't fall off with the weight or the pull of your sleeves. As you can see, I'm having a bit of trouble deciding exactly how much I want to alter that strap angle, as that's what all those lines are about. Once you're satisfied with your new pattern adjustments, it's time to cut everything out. Now, if I had been really clever, I would have measured one centimeter or three eighths of an inch out from the Sharpie line for seam allowance, but I didn't. <laughs> so that means that I'm going to have to add seam allowance each and every time I trace this, this pattern onto fabric. This can be handy if your seam allowance varies for different fabric, but I nearly always do one centimeter. So this wasn't a great choice on my part. Make sure to check any seams that meet, like the shoulder seam and the side seam, to see that they are the same size. You don't want to try and join a 10 inch seam to a 12 inch seam, unless of course you're easing, but that's a whole different story. So, and of course, don't forget to label your brand new pattern. With any new pattern, even ones with only minor changes from one that you've already previously used, you should always make a mock-up. This fabric is just some quilting cotton I had lying around, but I would recommend using a fabric that is as close as possible to your final product, since my bodice is eventually going to be made of two layers of canvas, a fashion layer, and a linen layer. This cotton was really a poor choice. You'll see later that it comes back to haunt me. This method of construction is called bag lining, which is great because it's quick and easy and produces a very clean looking finish, but it's not perfect per se since it's not a typical construction method for 16th century clothing. But if you happen to have a modern sewing machine, it's pretty darn handy. To bag line, you sew all of the outer pieces together, then all the lining pieces together, and then you sew that outer and inner lining shell to each other. Once sewn together, you clip all the corners so it'll turn properly, you turn the whole thing inside out, and then you use something pokey and pointy to poke out all the corners. Normally it's really easy to tell which side is the lining side and which side is your fashion fabric side, but since I'm using the same fabric for both here, there isn't a whole lot of difference on which side is which. Poking tool, courtesy of my husband. It's a hair stick. Time to iron everything smooth. I use a sort of pinching method to make sure that the edges are truly as far out as they can be and there's no fabric tucked up inside. Once you sew something with a bag lining, you'll know what I mean. It's tempting to skip ironing, especially for a mock-up, but see how lumpy and goofy that strap is? Ironing will help take care of that and will allow me to see the true edges of the bodice, which is part of the whole point of a mock-up. Once we're all ironed up, it's time to sew the strap seam. 
This isn't the cleanest finish, but for a mock-up, it's okay. Now for my favorite bit, we get to try it on. The mock-up has no rigidity yet, so I'm going to use some stays to help provide that conical shape as a base for the mock-up. I recommend test fitting your project often. It helps you catch fitting issues as soon as you can in the process. Uh, I've had enough projects where I didn't try it on till the very end and realized that there's some crucial error I made that if I had tried it on earlier, I could have fixed, but now it's just too far, too gone, and that project has to be given to somebody else or very, very drastically altered. Check your fitting often. I've decided that it fits well enough to go ahead and start the boning channels. For tools, I've got craft scissors and a couple of jewelry cutters and a bundle of extra big zip ties. I ended up not actually needing the scissors, but depending on what you've got, use what works. I cut each of the ties to the size of that front opening, clipped off the sharp corners, and then inserted it through an opening in the bodice edge, and then stitched a line next to it with a zipper foot to snug it up real close to the edge. The second channel here is actually empty, since that's where my lacing holes are going to go, and you don't want a bone in the way of your lacing holes. Then I keep cutting and sizing and stitching until I've got kind of an armored front thing going on. It's time to try it on again. I took in the straps and the side seam just a little bit to snug it up. I like to use a tapestry or a yarn needle and uh, some narrow ribbon to lace up my bodices. Those needles tend to have a really big eye, which is helpful. Once I'm laced in, I, you gotta give it some wiggle and jiggle and some movement to see if everything feels good. Do some stretches, do some chores if you feel like it. Sometimes I will wear a new mock-up around the house for a couple hours to see if any fit issues arise with time. What feels good as soon as you put it on might not feel as good once you've given it a few hours to settle in, and vice versa, honestly. You want to know now whether something is too loose or too tight. After all that, we've got our final result, a finished pattern. My mock-up told me that the pattern requires a few changes, so I took about half an inch out of the side seam and a smidge from the shoulder seam. Remember earlier, though, when I said that my fabric choice was going to bite me in the butt later? Yeah, this seam adjustment is part of that shenanigans. The strap adjustment was probably also not necessary, but it didn't really hurt anything either. With our new pattern complete, we can now start working on making the actual dress itself, which is super exciting. Go to the next video to see me start on the polka dot undergown. <laughs>